Spotify, AM 640. It's later with Mo Kelly. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And I remember, I'm pretty sure you do too. Well, you have to be of a certain age. And I am of a certain age. I remember when it was my dream to just have my own phone as in like in my room. Not like a, 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 a mobile phone, not like a smartphone, just a telephone, touch tone phone in my own room. Not my own number, just my own phone. When I was growing up, to have my own phone, I could have conversations somewhat privately and talk to girls in my room, on the phone, up until when my mother would pick up the phone and say, are you done yet? I have to use the phone because we only had one phone line back then and you know there was no such thing as an answer machine. People couldn't call in. The reason I'm talking about this, the reason I'm talking about this, how much has the world changed since then? I mean, it is really different now. They have six-year-olds, five-year-olds with their own mobile phone, smartphone, has internet capabilities. They can call anywhere. Parents can call them at any time. And if you thought that that's crazy, then they bring them to school. And, of course, they're disruptive, and it's been like this for quite some time. But that's how much the world has changed. And now LAUSD has said, no more. We're going to put a stop to this. These phones are disruptive. They're increasing bullying. They are decreasing meaningful conversation and communication between students. They've had enough of this. So tomorrow, school officials, LAUSD school officials, are poised to vote yes on a measure which would ban students from using their cell phones during the entirety of the school day. How this would work, I have no idea. How you would enforce it, I have even less of an idea. I just know it's a damn good idea. I don't know how it's supposed to work, though. In fact, they said even if it passes, they would have to work out the particulars and the specifics. But the ban would not go immediately into effect. They still have to work out all these details. And staff would be directed to develop and present to the public policies that prohibit student use of cell phones and social media platforms district-wide for the entire school day. This is not novel. There are schools around the country which have already implemented various forms of a cell phone ban. But it would be tremendous when you think about L.A., LAUSD, the second largest school district in the country, what that would mean if you're talking about a district-wide policy. Parents who would be against this, obviously, they're thinking of being able to contact their child at any time and all times. Uh, teachers and administrators are saying, yeah, but it's making it more and more difficult to maintain an environment which is conducive to learning. I understand both sides of this. I think as a teacher, both my parents were teachers. I would more lean to the side of the teachers than the parents needing to call their children all to or text them at any time of the day. I'm from the good old days where we had to walk up uh, backwards to school in the snow five miles each way. And when I went to school, I can't speak for Mark Ron or Wallace Sharp. You wouldn't dare. No, I wouldn't dare. But when I went to school, the only way parents could get in touch with their students, uh, their kids, with the exception of my parents because they worked at the school in which I w w attended, the only way parents could get back in touch with them back in the day was to call the administration building. That was it. And you could leave a message or you could send someone down the hall to find your kid in room 222 and then deliver the message that way and maybe bring you up to the front. You can answer that one phone line in like the administrator's office or the principal's office. That was the only way. And I understand that's archaic. I understand you can't do it like that. But isn't there somewhere in between? There's got to be somewhere in between. I don't think students need to have access to their phones in class. And I know most schools don't, they prohibit students from using phones in a classroom setting. But this is comprehensive. They're talking about anywhere, anytime during the course of the school day, not at recess, not at lunch. I'm not opposed to that, really. I'm not, I'm not, not, um, uh, well, before school, when they're on campus. Now, but I'm not working on a school campus these days. So let me defer to Twala Sharp, who's an administrator on a campus and dealing with various ages and various a-hole parents and students of varying cognitive abilities and, and disabilities. 
and their needs. And the reason I put it in that context, yeah, there is a serious need for parents in certain circumstances to be able to reach their children immediately. At our school, no children have cell phones. All of our paraprofessionals, when they are working, when they walk into the classroom, they are supposed to put their phones in a box by the teacher's desk. So you're not on the phone. You're paying attention to your student. I would love it if this was the way it was for my children during school hours. Already, my co-parent had to do a search or, or um, a browse on my daughter's phone to like see how much screen time she get. Her screen time is ridiculous. During she, school hours. During school hours. They're all day. She literally had to say, you know what? I am locking down screen time availability. During the day, you'll be able to make calls to me or your father, and we will be able to call you. That is about all you can do during on the phone during the day because this is insanity. And it's across the board. Every single kid at school, I beg LAUSD to enact this immediately. For me, it's common sense because I know how I was at that age. It would have been a bad idea to give me a phone. It's almost like giving me a video game. It, it would be tantamount to what we had as video games back then, where we would have this toy, if you will, and all of these capabilities with no parental supervision, literally no parental supervision. It was, it's, it's, it's antithetical to a learning environment. It, it's going to get in the way of anything they're trying to learn. It's actually worse than that because video games were a distraction. These cell phones can be used for means of destruction or disobedience, for mass, uh, you know, dishing parties, coordinating all types of antics. These cell phones during the day for, for bullying tactics, for sending messages, you know, to people, ooh, look at such and such as this. No, this is what's happening on these phones yeah, during the day. We, we had to pass physical notes back in my day. We had to write them and surreptitiously and in a clandestine way pass them yes. throughout class. And sometimes you get caught. We didn't have a chance to do boop, 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 shoot, and send a message to the girl we thought was cute. Mm. You could learn a lot from watching old prison films and like The Great Escape and stuff. That's how we had to communicate back in the day. But my question to Tawala is, is do you have like cattle prods to enforce this discipline? What are you going to do? You know what? And this is something that they would have to do. You would literally have to collect phones in homeroom at the beginning of the day. Every kid has to go to homeroom. Every teacher can have every student come and bring uh, their cell phones and put them in a box. And at the end of the day, you come back to homeroom and get your phones. Oh, good, good luck, luck with that. With that. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, look, I get it. And and it can be that if you see a, a child with phone out, you you write that child up. You send a note to the parent home. Do not send your child with this phone tomorrow. How about a shock collar, like like on dogs? If we could, yes. Okay. Psst. Yeah, there have to be there have to be consequences. Yeah. which are connected to their academic, and, and then you know the first kid who gets suspended or kicked out, then the parents are going to lose their mind because we live in a world today where nobody's kid is ever a bad kid. Oh so. no, it, it, it's after school. It's detention. Cell phone out, you're doing detention, you're cleaning up the school, you are, are writing standards, you're doing something to make it I hope so. like that, something you don't want to do. But, um, yeah, in, in theory, that sounds great. I'm I just know. saying I in know. execution and application, I don't know if that's actually going to work. When we come back, I want to tell you about how the first time in five years, as in since before the pandemic, all L.A. County pools are open for the summer. It's later with Mo Kelly, KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Now I'm going to play on my phone during this commercial break because, you know, I'm grown and I'm allowed to have a phone. Who's got a car battery? You get a lot of mileage out of those getting somebody's attention with a phone. I'm sorry. Did you say something? Car battery and a couple electrodes. What? Pull those pants down. I'm I'm busy. I'm on my phone right now. What? I'm doing something. (laughs) You're going to jail, Mark Rodder. Okay, we we got to do the news immediately. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. And I have some great memories swimming in the summer. Always look forward to it. When I was 10 years old, my mother made me take some 20 swimming lessons so I'd learn how to swim, wouldn't be afraid of the water, and I hated it at the time, but I'm appreciative and thankful to this day that she did. And it opened up my world. Had a chance to go swimming at uh, a friend's house. Bo, one of my groomsmen, we grew up together. We He was the only one in the neighborhood who had a pool, so we were always at his house during the summer in the pool, 
jumping off the roof of the house into the pool, doing all sorts of ill-advised and very dangerous things, you know, kid stuff. But it was good that I knew how to swim. And there were other opportunities to usually go to one of the L.A. County pools. It was something that was at least available to us back in the day if, you know, one of the friends in the neighborhood wasn't home or didn't feel like entertaining us. And when I saw this story that all L.A. County pools are now open six days a week with access to all aquatic facilities for the first time in five years, it reminded me of how important the L.A. County pools can be for a lot of young people, especially during the hottest months of the year. And this reopening marks the first time in five years that all pools will be operational and also opens up the long-weighted access to a potential cooling space for a number of communities. And depending where you live, and I was in a a typical middle-class community, only one person had a pool. They were especially the 1970s, they were considered a luxury or we thought it was, you know, if you had a pool, you were rich, you were doing something. Wait a minute, you have a two-story house and a pool? Oh, my goodness, lifestyles are the rich and famous. But the pools were something back then. I don't know if it still is considered that. But also as a first, going back to the story, the pool season, the L.A. County pool season, used to be just 10 weeks. And it would stop short sometime in August and if you've lived out here for any, any amount of time, you know that it can get really hot in late August, September, even sometimes into October. So this year they've extended the pool season from the original 10 weeks to five months, which would be inclusive of September and October. And let me point this to Mark Rahner. He may, may appreciate this as a former lifeguard. L.A. County starting this new pool season with over 580 lifeguards, and there was a lifeguard shortage back in 2023 coming out of the pandemic. They've also upped the salary. The starting lifeguard salary would be $23 an hour. I don't have really a reference point as to what it was before. Mark, do you remember what you were making as a lifeguard? Not $23 an hour, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, it's a different time, I'm sure. No, no, it was a long time ago. And I remember, like, the local evening magazine came to interview me when, when I was in my lifeguard speedo, and I'm like, ask me about the pay. Be sure to ask me about the pay. So you can <laughs> complain publicly? <laughs> On TV, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, how much training did you have to go to? Do you go through? Do you remember? Uh, Well, you had to get the training uh, in... In basic CPR? In school. No, there was like a whole lifeguard training course in college. You couldn't just have anybody just plop into the chair and, and give them a whistle. They're, they're, you had to be competent. Mm-hmm. Drag some bodies along the bottom of the pool? Uh, not along the bottom, but across several pool lengths, yeah. Uh-huh. Olympic size or like like a regular size? I would say less than Olympic size. Oh, no, no, Olympic size, yeah. Uh-huh. Big big pools. All right, all right. Well, to celebrate celebrate the reopening, a series of pool parties are going to be hosted at all of the county pools through the end of this week, welcoming visitors to enjoy free recreational swimming, games, food, and giveaways. The county said with over a billion visits expected this summer. Million visits. And I always say when you give people in neighborhoods something to do or a place to go, they're less inclined to do the things that, you know, idle hands and so forth. And Twala doesn't know this, but I'm going to buy him lessons at the local L.A. County pool. I'm going to get him certified. So he can swim? Uh, yeah, no. I will not. <laughs> I, look, I will never get into a public pool unless one of my children are in there drowning and I got a But dog, you can't say and that. And I've got a doggy paddle over to them or floating over to them. Look, I refuse. I am so happy that the public pools are open, but I also know that there's a dark side to the public pool, and that is all the urine and other uh Things that come out of the body while in the water, and I refuse. I'm not getting pink eye in some public pool. Look, just keep your mouth closed underwater. Make sure you don't have any open sores or cuts. You'll be fine. I refuse. There isn't enough chlorine in the entire L.A. County for me to get into a public pool. Okay, let me just say this to all. I understand your concern, but you're not wrong. (laughs) (laughs) No, he's not. (laughs) You know, I would never... And I mean this very respectfully, L.A. County. I would never get into an L.A. County pool now. Not because it's L.A. County. It's just I know public pools, people do things in public places that are, you know, typical for the public. 
L.A. County, Orange County, right? It, it does not Ontario. matter. Ontario. I don't look. Yeah. I don't care where. If it is a Bernardino. public pool, I Ventura. will not. I will not get in it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, at this point in life, you know, we can find a friend who has a pool in the backyard and yeah. do that, as opposed to and even the pool. then, because I don't know what your kids do when they get in this pool. You know, I, I thought that was an old tale that kids would get in the pool and then you know want do a number one or number two, but that's true. <laughs> It is it's true. absolutely true. A lots of one, for and, sure. I, and I don't, and I don't know why that is. Maybe because it's the warm water stimulates that or encourages them to. I don't know what it is, but it, it is a real thing. Lots of other things creep out of the body in the water. There was a study before the pandemic, and oh, we talked about this. this. Mo. <laughs> we talked about this that talked about all of the particulates. That are of the poop itch in the water. Okay, so you're saying that we shouldn't go to L.A. County beaches or L.A. County Look, pools. L.A. County beaches are damn near comparable, except there's Less chlorine. chlorine right. there's, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> look, but again, look, I'm happy. L.A., look, get the pools open. Let the kids go. Do what you do. I'm talking about me personally. These are my reasons for not getting in the water. All right. So let's let's um, turn around and look at the tote board and look at the list of places we should not go in L.A. Do not go on L.A. Metro. Um, do not go in L.A. County pools. Do not go um, L.A. County public beaches. Um, when we come back, we'll tell you that you shouldn't go to L.A. County 7-Elevens or any 7-Eleven for that matter. Oh, thank heaven. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. And if this story sounds familiar, it should because it's happened before. Multiple 7-Elevens in Los Angeles County were robbed by thieves, ski masks, guns. According to police, the most, most recent string of robberies took place in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, the first one was at the corner of Rosemead Boulevard and Duarte Road in East San Gabriel around midnight. And the reports of three armed men wearing ski masks who stormed the store. Two of the suspects were armed and pointed their weapons at the clerk, while the third suspect ransacked the, ca- ransacked the cash register for a total of about $300. And... Two hours earlier, another 7-Eleven on Duarte Road in Monrovia was also hit by three armed masked men. Likely it was connected. And let me just ask this question. I'm not trying to be flippant, but I'm asking the question. What is it that people think 7-Eleven has? Easy access? Okay, let's just say that. If you've ever been in a 7-Eleven, it's not like they have the Lexan glass in most of them. But they don't have a lot of money in the register. And you're going to have three people, presumably armed, to knock off one or two or three different 7-Elevens. How much money are you really getting? Let's say five, $600. And you're risking, I don't know, seven, eight different felonies along the way. What is it about 7-Eleven which says, please effing rob me? Because this is maybe the third or fourth time We've talked about multiple 7-Eleven robberies on a given occasion, in a given night, and people still think that 7-Eleven must be where all the gold in Fort Knox lives because they keep coming after 7-Eleven like it's nobody's business. And let me ask another question. Why would you continue to work at 7-Eleven? Presumably... You make less than someone in fast food. And I don't think the 7-Eleven job qualifies for the $20 an hour. So not only do you make less than the people at Jack in the Crack and McDonald's, you might get shot on any given day. At least robbed. Armed robbery. And you're not even making as much as someone at McDonald's. I would have to say, why would you continue to work at 7-Eleven? And imagine the corporate structure. When you're working at 7-Eleven, they'll have like a quarterly, I don't know, sales meeting, or they'll bring the employees together, and you'll meet with the district manager, and they'll take your questions and notes like, yes, we're aware of all the robberies. We want to assure you that your safety is of the utmost importance to us in 7-Eleven corporate office. What what do they tell employees? Because if I were the one who has to go to work, it's like, um... Uh, you want me to work from 
8 p.m. to 2 a.m. tonight? You know they just robbed three 7-Elevens last night. What do you, can I bring a gun? Can I bring a bat? Can I, you know, can, what is it I can do to protect myself? Because there's no way that I would work for 7-Eleven under these circumstances. Aha, but you're not uh, can't, taking into account uh, free Slurpee Fridays. That has to be it. Why someone would work there? Yeah, it has to be free Slurpees or some of those rotating hot dogs. There has to be some benefit to being there. You could, but you could always, you don't have to work there to get some of that stuff. For free though? <laughs> free Slurpee? Okay, I, look, I've had a gun pulled on me. I don't think I want to have a gun pulled on me just for the sake of better access to those hot dogs on that roller. You know, in all serious though, when I think about it, um, most 7-Elevens are franchised, right? And I think the people that work there have to have some connection to the franchisee owner. So I think a lot of fans, these franchises are family operated. They may hire like a kid or two to work the counter, but his family's working in there. Okay, but let's say that's true. They still have some sort of corporate divisional somebody they have to report to because they always have to make sure that the stores are uniform. They're doing this stuff the 7-Eleven way. Like, you can't just slow burpees as opposed to slurpees. You can't, you know, you yes. can't, you, you just can't make it up as you go. So there's probably some corporate structure there. And if I owned a 7-Eleven, they would have to tell me something that they could protect us or do something or they're at least trying to do something to make it less robbable. No, sense. they literally tell you when you sign on the dotted line, I'm sure it's in the fine print. You will in all likelihood be robbed within some time of the life of your ownership of the 7-Eleven. Once you sign, you are agreeing to this. You've got to agree to being robbed. I don't know if it says that in the fine print, but I'm I imagine that, like that. that when 7-Eleven people get together, it's like Quint and Hooper in Jaws, <laughs> telling stories. Yeah, yeah, comparing all their old injuries, like, well, I got this one. And uh, then we were in the water, and <laughs> sharks were everywhere. Yeah, except it's people coming in to rob them. <laughs> How do you get up and get out of bed? We talk about people who work for Metro with the distinct possibility that you might have to fight someone or get stabbed by someone. What is it if you get out of bed and like, oh, shoot, it's today today that I'm going to get robbed? I don't think you understand the work ethic that makes you the United States the greatest country on the face of the earth, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't get it. it USA, USA. USA. Look, I'd have to find a job somewhere else. It, even if my my father owned the Seven Eleven, it's like no, I will work somewhere else where I won't get a gun pointed at me. Nah, you can't disrespect the family tree. Watch me, watch me, because if pops is not is not going to be there and and have to uh, help out and and work and protect me when someone pulls a gun, I'll go somewhere else. You'd probably disinfect a wound with a Slurpee pretty well. Do I need to say it again? Of all the time that we've been doing these stories, I have yet to mention an AMPM. I've yet to mention a Circle K. Now, they might get robbed, but I don't know if, of three or four of them getting robbed in a single evening. We've had at least, no exaggeration, this calendar year, at least nine different 7-Elevens that I know that we've, we've reported on that have been robbed. What that signifies is that the 7-Elevens are convenience stores. Those are the most convenient. The others just aren't robbed? As, yeah, the others just aren't as convenient. No, and I think it has to do, if you know how 7-Eleven is, is set up, you have an open counter, and it's easy to hop over the counter. The the AMPMs by me have the Lexan glass. You can't do that. It's, it's much more difficult. Why even bother with a counter? If you know what's going to happen, just... Just leave everything wide open. Well, but but we've reported on enough of, the, enough of these where we know that the the robbers aren't getting away with any real money. If I came across a story was like, oh, you know, the the assailants are thought to have absconded with four thousand dollars. Like, okay, now now I get it. It's you know, there's a little bit of money in the in the till, as they say. There might be something for them. But if you're gonna knock off a place, why Seven Eleven? There's, there's no money there. Every little bit counts, Mo. Not really. Not really. When you think of the money they had to spend on ski masks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Even criminals 
have bills to pay. Okay. There, there are expenses. There are sunk costs, which go into being a, a criminal. Yeah, we got a new guns and ammo tax kicking in too. So, uh, you might want to knock over as many 7-Elevens as possible before then. You think that they're buying those guns and ammo legally? I believe in the law. So, of course. Okay. I don't question the law. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. When we had told you about how if your car was damaged by potholes or debris on freeways, you had a way to get your car fixed. You There was a way that you could get compensated for the damages. And then we told you many months later that, well, Caltrans was not keeping their side of the bargain. Between 2018 and 2021, Caltrans approved roughly one in every 10 damage claims. We talked about this last week, but I wanted to circle back to it. The approval rate then dropped in 2022 to just one in 25, 4%, Caltrans has dropped even below that this year. So it's almost impossible for you to get your car fixed or at least compensated for the damages, let's say, which you had to pay to get your car fixed because of streets which have not been maintained. Or that we had a lot of rainfall, we got those potholes, and they would fill them up, but they would fill them in a in a shoddy way, and then they would get another pothole as soon as it rained again. We heard about the couple who was going around filling potholes on their own, and he said, no, 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 you can't do that. You got to stop that. That's illegal. But they weren't filling the potholes. They were not fixing the streets in a timely fashion, and they weren't compensating people like you and me who were turning in damage claims. And then CBS News California did an investigation about how often Caltrans was or was not um, uh, compensating people and and um, filling these damage claims. And they found that Caltrans damage claims from potholes and debris tripled in the first half of last year and the approval rates dropped by half. That's the backstory. Now, California lawmakers are getting into the fray. Lawmakers also want to know why Caltrans has been denying so many damage claims. I would like to know as well. And some are even proposing legislation to fix the claims process. No, it's not, it's, it's not a problem with the claims process. They're just denying people. They're refusing to pay people. They made this blanket promise like, hey, if your car has been damaged because of potholes or debris, this is what you need to do. You fill out this claim and then you can be compensated and you can be made whole. It was a lie. That's all it was. It was a lie. It, they were giving you a false promise. They were telling you that they that they could uh, uh, you know, compensate you for the damage to your car, which was not your fault. This is damage, which was not your fault. We remember we had talked about the potholes, how bad they were. I was talking to Stefan about we knew the same potholes on the same uh, uh, part of the street on El Segundo Boulevard. And would just sit there for month after month after month. And then it would rain again and you get even more potholes. And if you didn't know where those potholes were, you run the risk of messing up your tire, your alignment. Other debris could uh, further damage your car. And it seems like, well, it really didn't matter because even it was, if it were the fault of the street or a pothole, you couldn't get a damage claim approved. Back in February, Assembly Member Joe Patterson had reached out to CBS News because of their report. And he wanted to see whether he could find out any answers as to why. And back in February, he introduced Assembly Bill 2848, and the bill would have forced Caltrans to pay for specific claims for hundreds of windows cracked and shattered by loose gravel over a four-month period on a busy stretch of just I-80 in his district. Well, he was just talking about loose gravel and debris over a four-month period on a stretch of I-80. Now, imagine what we have to deal with over the totality of the state. This is something that we have to deal with up and down the street, northern and southern California. Now, also, according to Steve Nelson, a public information officer of Caltrans District District 3, Caltrans did not pay those claims because they said they were, quote, aware of the situation 
and we're working to fix it, close quote. What does that mean? You didn't you didn't pay the claims because you're working on the situation. Either you pay the claims or you don't pay the claims. The department also said in April of 2023 that that particular stretch of road took so long to fix because putting down hot asphalt requires temperatures of at least 45 degrees. These are two different unrelated things here. If the street is messed up or the road is not properly paved and it damages my car, that is separate and distinct from you telling me how long it's going to take to fix the road and why it's been taking so long. One has nothing to do with the other. If Mark Ronner should drive this car over that road and his car is damaged, the question isn't, well, how long is it going to take for you to repair the road? No, the question is, how long is it going to take you to pay me for the damage to my car? But there's nothing quite like that feeling of hitting one and realizing, oh, oh shoot. Oh, that was a serious one. <laughs> or you hit it and you almost like hold your breath for like two seconds. Like, did my wheel fall off? Yeah. Yeah. How can you put a price tag on that? Yeah. Nobody <laughs> likes a whiner. Mo. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> is my muffler still on my car? Yeah. Yeah. Did I bottom out there? Uh, am I going to be walking the rest of the right. way home? And you take your hands off the steering wheel to see how badly your your car is out of alignment now. I've, I've driven over a pothole and it's exploded my tire. I mean, it doesn't take a lot, especially when you're dealing with these severe potholes and you can't see them, especially at night or if it's during the rainy season. All of the asphalt just looks black and clear. It's, it's really difficult to deal with. And then after your car is messed up, We've been telling people, hey, just call Caltrans and make a claim and, you know, they'll they'll approve your claim and you can be made whole again. When all of that was untrue, they had no intentions of approving these claims. Oh, they'll make you whole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to want to try that again? No, no, I don't. We, we, we don't have uh, any good rim shot service tonight. No, uh, we don't. No, we don't. Uh, Robin doesn't do that. Robin's that's, that's asleep at the rim shot wheel. No, no, no. Robin does not. She but, does not do rim well, shots. Let me just say this. I like to be a glass half full person, as you well know, over the last few years. So when I hit one of those disastrous, one of those catastrophic potholes, I like to focus on the fact that I'm so grateful that I thought ahead and had AAA, the relief of that instant right after. I get mad because there are a lot of times like I see it and I try to miss it and I still hit it and I get so angry because, okay, and I think in my mind, there's $200 gone. There's another hundred dollars gone. Oh, that tire is gone. Uh, it's just adding up in my head. And to now know that it doesn't matter. I wouldn't have been able to got to get the money back anyhow. No, but it's fun to browse for new cars. Honestly. No, no, not, not fun at all. Oh. And you would like to think that, Hey, it's, 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 uh, it was a worthy idea or at least the idea was good where the people were going to be reimbursed for the damages having nothing to do with the fault, so any supposed fault of the driver. That's the way it should be, right? You know, the street is not properly maintained. Your car has been damaged for reasons having nothing to do with you. That's the least that the state can do is reimburse you for that damage. And now you figure out, hmm, they were only approving 4% or or less of claims. No, nah, there's no car guardian angel. You're in a car state of nature. So you're a car theist? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Okay. KFI AM640, we're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to KFI everywhere, like you haven't noticed. KFI. And KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.